Is it time to start rethinking supply chains? John Scanapieco is chair of the global business team at the Baker Donaldson Law Firm. Hi, John. How are you? Good. How are you doing this afternoon? Doing good, and thanks for being with us. What, in your opinion, uh, has caused, I mean, our, our companies actually rethinking their supply chain since the start of the U.S.-China trade war? Uh, yes, I, I think you had initially with just the U.S.-China trade war, the imposition of tariffs and the uncertainty that that trade war was bringing to business. What, how is it going to end? When, if it ever is going to end? I think that got people starting to think about, do I need to start moving um, some of my, maybe my, my supply chain from China to maybe different parts of the world? You mm -hmm. also had issues where within China itself, I think there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, still favoritism shown to the Chinese companies and non-Chinese were starting to feel, I think, some of the pressure there. So all of that was then leading to these companies thinking about where do I go uh, if, if I go anywhere. Yeah. And even before the trade war, I think they were talking about wages rising in Chinese factories and it was becoming less less of a cost uh, advantage to, to produce there. Oh, no, it's, that, yeah. that is exactly right. I, and, I, you know, the cost now is not what it was, say, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you, you started seeing a migration to places like uh, Vietnam, um, uh, to Thailand, Malaysia, mm -hmm. uh, even uh, Cambodia and Myanmar to some extent. Um, you know, for, again, depending on what you're trying to do, I mean, because not everybody has a, the infrastructure necessarily to support uh, manufacturing and the logistics that are required. So yeah. all of that, I think, but still, folks are still looking. Um, and then, of course, looking to come back maybe this way. Uh, Mexico, I think, mm -hmm. has been a big beneficiary of the U.S.-China uh, trade war. Well, I, do, I want to talk about some of the specifics of yeah. possible, possible sourcing alternatives, but I just want to also mention now, Along comes the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> right. How is that? I mean, is, is that putting a break on decisions? Is it accelerating decisions? Is it having no if, impact on decisions? Where, where is that figuring well, into decisions? I think, I think that even probably more than anything else has really got people thinking where, again, I don't, a lot of people don't, didn't think about the supply chain within the supply chain, sometimes within the supply chain, hmm. and didn't realize maybe that China, for example, was maybe played a big role within their overall supply chain, the success of that supply chain. So. Uh, when you, you know, back in January, when you first had uh, the, the COVID crisis really impact China, starting to shut down China, that that supply shock really took, I think, took a lot of people kind of off guard. Um, you know, some folks really understand their supply chains, and, and, and they, they recognize that fairly quickly. And we were getting calls, what should I do? How should I deal with this? But a lot of folks just didn't, they didn't understand, well, my, my widget is made in Korea. Well, they didn't realize, though, that three, let's say, of the four key components were coming from China uh, mm -hmm. first before they went to Korea. So that has caused a lot of people now to rethink, um, you know, how do I really deal with this? And then as, that, as, as COVID then swept the globe, you started seeing then some of these same issues popping up in Europe and then, say, in the Americas. And that was that supply shock. Now mm -hmm. we have the flip, which is that demand shock and how all of that now is playing out. Um, I think has caused a lot of folks to at least, at least we're recommending that they really do a deep, deep dive into their supply chain so they truly understand what does it really look like. And again, that supply chain within the supply chain, so they, mm -hmm. they understand from the, because even if I could get my product from, say, the manufacturer in China to the port, well, I couldn't find a vessel as most of the vessels had been rerouted. Um, a lot I of cancellations of sailings, yeah. That, mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. And then even if I was going to use air, which is, you know, very expensive, um, a lot because of the uh, passenger um, flights had been canceled, you know, I can't remember the exact number now, but the, the cargo capacity was cut to a fraction of what it normally would have been. And so that cargo capacity was even at a premium. And mm -hmm. if you could find it. And so, I, in fact, one of our clients actually went and leased it, his, his own fleet of jets just to deal with that issue um, because they, it wasn't reliable and it was very, very expensive. And sometimes you'd get bumped um, because someone offered to pay, you know, a little bit more. And so mm -hmm. they went out and did their own thing. But yeah, so I think all of that has really now led to this rethinking of um, how, how do I build resiliency and kind of redundancy 
into my supply chain. Okay, so if it was just China where this was happening, that would lead to a natural decision to resource somewhere else. And yet, as you point out, the pandemic spread across the globe. So it's not a matter of, well, I'm just going to shift my manufacturing to another country because it's happening everywhere. So what are you telling your clients, at least within this temporary period of the pandemic, when resourcing or isn't necessarily an option? Right. And, and, that's, and that's the issue. Sometimes, for example, one of my clients, China is the, is the place. Really, no one else makes their product that they need anywhere mm -hmm. really in the world. Or if they do, it's, it's maybe of lesser quality and it's you know, very uh, exponentially more expensive. So they're kind of, companies like that, I think, are stuck. Um, although I, I've told them to start thinking about, you know, maybe there are ways that they can invest in, say, a manufacturer to help them you know, get their uh, um, uh, capacity, their, their technique and all that up to speed. Um, so those companies, I think, are, are the ones that are having the hardest time. But others are, they really are looking around to see where it makes most sense. And in some cases, they're identifying potentially a source in, say, Europe, or they're looking at the Americas and looking mm -hmm. at Asia and really getting to more of a regional focus on their supply chains and then moving away from this one extended global supply chain. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's become something that people are thinking about. But in a lot of cases, I mean, you know, for the big companies, I think they can afford the time to to make that inquiry. They can also afford the cost because that mm -hmm. that is makes it more expensive. But, you know, so many of the companies that that I know, you know, they're small and medium enterprises. They don't necessarily have a, uh, you know, uh, a sourcing department. It's, you know, usually somebody who's doing three other jobs. Mm -hmm. And so it that's become the challenge. I mean, they really are feeling like they're awash in this. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And even if I could, it's so expensive that I'm not sure I can even do it. But it could be for many of them, even the small ones, it, they're just simply in the long run, no alternatives other than to actually start to look for other places. If that being the case, you just threw out a lot of different possibilities, Central America, Europe, Mexico, whatever. Do any of those rate particularly popular in the minds of companies today? Is it possible to generalize or are people just looking all over the world for alternatives? Well, I think it depends on what you do and where your markets are. So where you end up selling. So for example, mm -hmm. if um, I have one client, um, they are really focused right now on Europe because it seems like Europe was presenting them with the best growth opportunities. And so they're looking more to a regional focus and looking at Europe. I have others that still want to use China, okay, but maybe not 100%. And they uh, want to bring, you know, they bring their products here in the United States and they sell in the United States. So they're exploring, say, Mexico, for example, mm -hmm. um, and having that triangle of U.S., China, and uh, Mexico. I have some others that um, really are looking at, they, they still sell most of their product here in the U.S., but they're looking at an Asia supply chain, so moving some to, say, Malaysia, Vietnam, you know, places like that, but still consider part of, you know, using China um, in, in some respects. So can, those, it, can those other locations scale, though? I mean, you had factories in China with tens of thousands of yeah. workers. <laughs> you can't do that in Vietnam. Right. No, or, uh, we're, no we're, they're, they're, most of the, a lot of these places were at full capacity. I, and I think that's the challenge mm -hmm. is China has done a wonderful job over, say, the last 30 to 40 years of building out one of the, I mean, greatest manufacturing logistics. I mean, I, you know, you think of the capacity they had to, to, to manufacture and move product to ports and then from ports to other destinations. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. And so I think that is the challenge that some are finding that, yes, I want to move, but I can't go to any of those places, say in Asia, because they just don't have the capacity or the capabilities. Really to, to or the in infrastructure. Need. And what about right. labor? I mean, you draft employment and agency agreements around the world. What are the main labor issues that you're encountering? Uh, well, in China, it was a lot of, our, we, so we represent some U.S. companies that have operations in, in China, factories in China. And that was the challenge um, as COVID kind of swept China, you know, with the uh, labor, you know, the labor rules. Um, so you have, you know, your national rules, and then you had your sometimes provincial and then even local. Um, and then managing the workforce within that, because, of course, the natural response to a U.S. company in terms of a downturn is to maybe do a reduction in force or something like that, which you just can't really do. And that has been the challenge, I think, really around the world 
uh, with some of our clients that I do a lot of their global kind of employment work for is helping them manage all that because countries are um, uh, responding to this crisis in very different ways. And so on a manufacturing side, um, again, uh, the uh, what you have to do then to maybe set up a, an operation in these countries becomes very expensive, very time consuming. And again, mm-hmm. there's so much uncertainty that, that some are just saying, okay, I'm going to hold while others are saying, I mean, ah, taking there's, advantage. There's yeah. the point I wanted to ask you about. Is it possible that some companies are moving too hastily? Because what happens if they resource, they come back to the Western hemisphere, they're paying more for manufacturing, but they're leaving behind all the disadvantages with that they see like tariffs and the like along comes a new administration drops all the tariffs and suddenly China looks good again, but, it's, but they're already here at a disadvantage to companies that hung, that hung back and didn't move so quickly. Right. Is well, that I a mean, danger? I'm, yes, it is. I, I'm, you know, I'm very bullish on, on, on doing business in China. I think you can do it. I think you have to be very smart about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So take what I'm about to say with, with that. Um, I think whoever wins the next election, uh, there's going to be friction with China. There, there are issues that have to be addressed. How they address them, though, I think the prescription for addressing some of the wrongs, I think that may change. And you're right, the tariffs may may go away ultimately. Um, other things may come into place. So, yeah, I think people have to be very careful because it, there is a, um, I think the, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, i got to do something. And then you also have some that are just uh, either out of patriotism or just this this idea that that they need to say get out of China. They mm-hmm. come here, and I think then they 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 run the real risk of being uh, of kind of uh, hurting their own competitiveness because of course we all know that that making a product in the United States can be more expensive. Our labor costs more and other things cost more. Even though we may save on let's say the shipping, you know, from China here, mm-hmm. um, it's still going to cost more. Our non-U.S. competitors may be still sourcing in Asia or these other low-cost uh, jurisdictions, bringing that product in, or some of our U.S. competitors may be doing the same. And so I think they really they run a risk of maybe pricing themselves out of the market because in some cases you just can't pass on that increased cost to the consumer because I think we have all gotten too accustomed to – I don't want to say, you know, to say buying our products at Walmart or buying our products at these lower cost. Uh, super uh, cheap. You know, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and you know something, I think we all say this, I'm happy to pay a good price for a good product, but mm-hmm. I don't want to overpay. Right. Right. And so who knows um, what that means when it comes down to but, it, but, but yeah. right. But I mean, so you have some of that, I think that, that may also cause issues for uh, mm-hmm. some of these folks that are, that are making these decisions. And that's why I think some, I think, uh, you know, a better way is maybe not to move entire, you know, reshape your entire um, supply chain, but to take a look at it and see maybe where you can improve upon it. Yeah. Um, whether okay. that is, so it may be moving little bits and pieces that maybe provide you really looking for where's the real weakness in that supply chain. And mm-hmm. I mean, in weakness, not just in terms of, well, if we have another pandemic or a financial crisis or something like that, it's looking at it from the perspective of even who has the financial wherewithal in my supply chain? Who can, where are the bottlenecks within that where I can really get caught? And so if that one piece gets held up, what does that do to the rest of my uh, ability to say to produce my product so I can mm-hmm. ultimately bring it to market? You know, things like that. I think, yeah. and then even just process improvements along the way, I think can also make a big difference. Okay, so no easy answers, but definitely the no. need for companies to get a grip on their supply chains and start considering some the possibility of rethinking what they're, what they're doing. John Skenapieko of Baker Donaldson, thank you so much for kind of laying out the, the, uh, the, 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 the options for companies and helping us to understand what, what they have to do going forward. Thanks very much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.